I'll undertake a roll call. Okay, Councillor John Crawley. Present. Councillor Michael Hutchison. Here. We've got apologies from Dr. Maggie Bochel, and we've also got apologies for Councillor John Cox. We have Councillor Doreen Mayer here in attendance in the chamber. Councillor Isabel Davidson. Here. Councillor Sandra MacDonald. Here. Councillor Miranda Radley. Present. Councillor Glenn Reid. Present. Councillor Ian Yule. Here. Mr Colin Allenach. Mr Jerry Donald. Present. And we've also got apologies for Mr Ian Ross. Thank you. I'll now hand you back to the chairperson. OK, good afternoon. Um, first of all, we'll have the declaration of interest if anyone's got any and agree the transparency statements. OK, moving on to 1.2 minutes of the board meeting the 7th of September. Is there anyone um, got any points on this? Was it accepted? Thank you. Um, 1.3. Uh, board meeting dates 22-23 and I'll pass over to Mark. Thank you Chair. Um, this, this is the normal report that comes to the to the board at this time of the year to approve the proposed dates for, for next year. Um, myself, um, Nesdram's team and the my, my counterpart and the share colleagues have looked at the diary for, for dates next year and the dates are, have been selected, proposed, included in, in the report in front of you. Unfortunately, the, the 15th of December date this year um, in the chamber um, is no longer available um, and that's outlined in the report as well. So there is an option for, for, the, for the board to agree um, the date, uh, proposed date for the 8th of December at 2pm in the, in the townhouse in the chamber as well. Recommendations in front of you are to consider the above and agree the proposed dates and following which um, I'll arrange to send out appointments to all the members of the board. Just to point out that there is a meeting um, in the morning here in the chamber and there is a risk, I reckon, um, I guess, that uh, it might run over, but um, I suspect that's been taken into consideration. OK, that's noted. Um, I think that's OK. Yeah, that's it's agreed. Uh, so can we uh, recommend the consider the above dates and agree the proposed dates and request that appointments be sent out to members following this matter, uh, meeting? Thank you. Moving on to 3.1, uh, 22-23 budget matters and Ellie Stolt is going to present that. Thank you, Chair. This budget matter report provides an update on the Nestron's budget monitoring for 2022-23 and forecast outturn position. Appendix 1 details the summary position as at the end of September, showing expenditure to date of £813,391 and the forecast for the year remaining at the budgeted level. Appendix 2 sets out a list of the proposed environments for the remaining financial year, which needs to be approved by this board. The report contains a summary of changes in projects for which Nestrans receives external grant funding, an additional active travel funding of 140,000 associated with the adult cycle training project has been agreed. However, due to more preparatory work being required. The project is no longer being progressed in the current financial year and the funding has now been redistributed towards the bike recycling reuse scheme. There's an update regarding the pension discretion policy. 
It is noted in the report before you that Nestrans will make submissions to Northeast Scotland Pension Fund by the end of October. However, further update from Council was received after the agenda pack was circulated. As discussions within the Council are still ongoing and the terms have yet to be considered by the Council's senior leadership team, a further extension to December has been requested. Nestrans still intended to adopt the same positions as the Council and this will be reported to the Board for consideration and possible further revision in December. In relation to the Strategic Transport Fund, there is still currently £484,594 being retained. 16 developments are still to make a claim and there have been no claims made in the current financial year. There are five recommendations for the Board to approve. Note the monitoring position and forecast presented in Appendix 1. Approve the environments set out in Appendix 2. Note the update on projects for which Nestrans receives external grant funding. Note the update on the pension discretion policy. And note the strategic transport fund position. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? Oh, Councillor Ewan, you sorry. You all, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, in relation to the Strategic Transport Fund, um, I, I take it from the way this is worded that the onus is on the the developers to ask for their money back rather than restaurants to put a check in the post unsolicited. Effectively, yes, um, we, we are doing more than that in that we will try to identify who is um, who's the owner of the money, if that's the right, the right um, expression. But where a, a development has maybe taken place but land has been passed through various agents. It, it's sometimes difficult to actually identify who would be entitled to that money back. So I think we're, we're looking to, to work with the legal departments and the planning departments at the two councils and determine whether it's possible to identify who that money should be refunded to. And the option, I guess, would be to actually try to use that money for the purpose it was originally intended to support transport interventions in and around the developments that they that it took place close to. So it is quite a complex piece of work um, and involves probably five different departments, but you know, it is something that we have committed that we will try and have a look at uh, going forward. Ian, would like to come back? Thank, thank, thanks, Mr. Dixon. Thanks, Rab. That's helpful. Um, so, at what point um, is it reasonable to use the money for the purpose to which we did, um, acquired it in the first place? Um, I mean, presumably, some time has to. We have to go a fair period of time to pass before we can start spending money that's not ours. Yeah, I, th I think a reasonable period of time probably has passed, four or five years since most of these payments were made. Um, I, I think there would be a slight risk if someone then came back to us in year six or year seven and said you owe us X thousand pounds. Um, but I think if, if we were spending it on things which Nestrans would probably spend anyway, it might be that it would be acceptable that we would then be able to pay that back and underspend in other areas. Um, but certainly that's why we want the lawyers to be involved. Um, and, that, and that's why it's been more complex than I would have liked it to be. But uh, yeah, we are looking at potential solutions that, that would be beneficial all around. Thank you very much. Mrs. Bloss. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Fiona Kloss. I'm a legal advisor to Nice Trans today. Um, it's just perhaps to clarify and confirm what Rab said about the complex situation surrounding these monies. We are looking into it as a joint effort and we'll probably be seeking further legal advice on that. So I understand the there may be a report um, and some work to come back to the board in the next couple of months. So it was just really just to confirm the complexity of those matters. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Sanjay MacDonald. Thank you very much. A different uh, matter. I, I just wanted to um, to ask around the um, I mean, I, I see in front of us that the cycle training project is is not happening and, and the money is, is being um, hopefully um, in, in next year. But I would have thought that these two schemes were very much hand in hand um, because having, you know, read up about um, cycle Reuse schemes is very much part of that is to then help those that that do get the bikes to be able to use them effectively. And so having a training project that that went along with um, the recycling of, of bikes did seem to make um, sense to me. And it was just maybe to get a an understanding of, of, of that time lag and when the, um, the training project might come into being, um, albeit next year. I don't know if John's able to shed any light on that, John Barn. Sorry, no, there's nothing I can add to this. So it is something we would like to deliver when we can, but it's just not been possible to uh, to deliver it within the time scale that we had originally intended. OK, there's no other questions, so we've moved to uh, the recommendations. Uh, one, note the monitoring position forecast presentation in Appendix 1. Approve the relevant... Just... So apologies, I've got my hand behind up. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Hutchison. It keeps coming down by itself. Uh, it was just on Appendix 1, it's got the the environments and it's got the net. I assume the environments would net to zero. If we're taking money from one fund and putting it into another, then those should cancel out. It's got a net surplus though of about two hundred pound. Or just to kind of query how that where that two hundred pounds come from, or if that if that's because I thought that really should have. I thought that number should be zero just off the top of my head. And uh, the appendix one doesn't include any environments um, proposed in this um, board meeting. That two hundred pound, I believe, is the clear error error we had at the beginning of the year. And uh, Jenny, is that right? Correct me if that's not right. Um, and then we just decided to um, co correct that error of two hundred pound. Um, oh. Yeah. So it's correcting another. I've got. I've got you know That makes sense. I was kind of find. I was trying to find within that spreadsheet if it's from an effort one. That makes sense. Thank you very much for that. Okay. No other questions. So we go back to the recommendations. One. Note the monitoring position and forecast presentation. Appendix one. Approve the environment amendment set out in appendix two. Note the update on projects for which Nestrams receives external grant funding. Note the update on the pensions discretions policy and note the strategic transport fund position. Thank you. We now move on the 4.1 director's report and that will be Rab. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item 4.1, as you say, is the Director's Report and gives a, an update on liaison and meetings that have been held since the last meeting of the Board. Um, a number there, you can see quite a, an active period, um, but in particular I wanted to draw attention to the last one on the list, that yesterday we had a presentation um, on the Aberdeen to Central Belt Rail Scheme. To my knowledge, it's the first time that two regional transport partnership boards have come together to receive a, a joint presentation. I thought it was really useful and maybe as an example of uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of teams meetings. Uh, I certainly thought it was useful and glad to see progress on that project um, towards uh, an implementation by 2026. There's also a, a very Busy period of meetings between now and Christmas, and uh, 
I think it'll be all hands to the pumps in terms of of uh, getting involved in them. Some of them person to person, and some of them on teams. The the board are asked to note the progress, um, but happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Probably now, Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, just notice the meeting on the 13th of October about the big, big issue share bike progress meeting. Uh, just wondering what, what the update of that is. Yep, my understanding is that the um, the progress is being made towards a launch of the share bike um, scheme. It is a commercial um, operation and therefore we're not driving or delivering. So we're, we're dependent on others, i.e. big issue and share bike uh, in terms of the, the launch of that. But I'm told it's imminent or fairly soon. Councillor so Sandra McDonald. On that one, I wondered if it would be possible um, to ask um, uh, Mr Dunn whether the uh, email that was shared with um, councillors uh, on Aberdeen City Council could be shared with the members of this board, because I think that would give uh, more information um, to Mr Alanach and others about um, what's happening with that scheme, Mr Dunn, if that's possible. Uh, through you, Chair, yeah, Councillor McDonald got to um, her microphone before I got to mine. Um, absolutely, um, that can be shared. So the, the intention by the Big Issue Share Bike is to launch at the start of November. Uh, as um, Mr Dixon said, it is a privately run um, uh, operation, so it will be for them to decide exactly when they launch. But happy to um, happy to share that email with the members of Nestrans. It does set out some FAQs and some other information which might be useful, including maps of the of the intended locations and so forth. So I'm happy happy to do that through the chair. Okay, that's great. If you can get that um, to the board, that'd be great. Um, Councillor Sandra McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 24, it, um, it's reported that the Bridge Street, Guild Street, Market Street bus priority measures will be implemented in early 2023. Um, and I just would like to um, uh, maybe get some, some, some more information on that because um, I, I, I wasn't, or maybe should have been, but I, I wasn't aware of that particular timetable uh, as such and, and just wanted to get some more information about that. David. Um, thank you, Chair. I am having some. No, there it is. I was having some difficulty with cameras. Um, the we we looked at the programming of um, what are referred to as ETRO two, which is the Bridge Street, Guild Street, Market Street uh, bus priority measures. Um, it it was possible, um, or it 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 could have been uh, achieved before Christmas, but I think um, it would have meant that the the changes would have came into effect in the middle of the Christmas period. For that reason, it was felt that to um, to push it into early next year uh, was more beneficial. It also gives the teams, which will be stretched at that time of the year, um, a little bit more uh, time and it can be sort of uh, properly managed. Obviously, the instruction from um, our city growth and resources and, and full council in the city was to implement those measures uh, as quickly as possible to obviously support the bus partnership funding, which was provided to South College Street on the basis that those um, bus priority measures would be implemented. So that is the that is the 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 timeline at the moment. Thank you. Okay, there's no other questions on that. Um, so we'll go to the recommendation of Note the progress on the liaison arrangements with other RTEPs, Scottish Government and others, and arrangements for future further meetings, future meetings. OK, we will now move on to 4.2, climate change reporting, and it will be Kelly Wiltshire. Hi there, thank you, Chair. 
Um, so this report is um, to give the board an update on our climate change reporting. Nestrans, as a public body, has a statutory obligation to report annually to the Scottish Government on our climate change reporting. And this is our eighth year that we have done so. Um, the report gives you a little bit of background into the legislation and the Climate Change Act and targets and how transport fits into that. So you can see that transport accounts for around 36% of Scotland's total greenhouse gas emissions. And of that, road transport makes up 66% of the transport greenhouse gas emissions. So transport really is a key part of reducing our climate change emissions in Scotland. Um, what I wanted to, before I go through the statistics was just to note that we rent 20% of Archibald Simpson House and as such we claim 20% of the emissions from that building. That doesn't mean that we necessarily have emitted those 20% but that's the parameters that we report on because we don't have a smart meter in Archibald Simpson House. You can see that there is a table there, table one, which gives our um, carbon emissions reporting for 2021-22 and 2020-21. That, that's just so you've got a bit of a comparison. It's quite difficult to compare year on year your carbon emissions because the emissions factors change year by year. So they're not directly comparable, but it gives you a good sort of overview. You can see that a lot of them are quite similar in terms of water and refuge. There was a reduction in our the amount we used in electricity this year and also for staff working from home. The staff working from home is basically because we had two less members of staff during 2021-22 than the previous year and we also were in the office a bit more often than we were in the previous year as well. So overall we had a, a reduction in emissions down to 6.3 tonnes um, in our reporting year and this year for the first time we've also been asked by the Scottish Government to introduce targets um, so we have got one target, target one, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50 percent between 2020 and 21 and 25, 26. That's financial years. And our second target is to achieve net zero emissions before 2045. So you can see the table below there. We've done what our historic emissions are and what we are proposing to do in terms of our targets. At the moment, um, Nestrans it does an awful lot to do with climate change. Almost all of our um, projects that we're trying to do is very much around mode shift, improving air quality and reducing the amount of vehicle kilometres. So almost all of the projects we are involved in have some kind of emission reduction um, side to them. At present, Nestrans is very much focused on mitigation, which is reducing our emissions and the projects that we're involved in, and less so in terms of carbon offsetting, for example. I have put in a paragraph there around carbon offsetting and that it is available, but at present, um, I think we're looking to just try and meet our targets by actually reducing our emissions. So I've got two recommendations for the board. The first one to note the report and the requirement for Nestrans to report on its activities and policies in respect to climate change duties and to approve the proposed targets for Nestrans to reduce its emissions and work towards net zero emissions. And I'm happy to take any questions. I don't see any questions coming up there. Councillor oh, Davidson. Oh, Councillor Davidson. Thanks very much for comment and then a question. So it's good to see that you've got homework included in here, as, but I think that's really hard to estimate properly. And most of us are sitting in freezing cold house because of our sheds, in my case. But it's good to see that that's considered. Um, and the other thing is, I'm really interested to see that mixed recycling has the same emission factor as um, municipal waste. Is that right? Can, you, can we not? Yeah, it's, it's recycled. Can we not change that? It's um, partly our refuge is and municipal waste is done through um, 
industrial to combustion. So, but obviously that's only up until when the fire happened in Nolans, but that doesn't affect the reporting for this year. Um, so we don't actually have things going to landfill, it is combustion, so that is slightly different emissions, but that is certainly the emissions factor that we've been told to use um, on the spreadsheet from the Scottish Government. We all have a template, all public bodies have to fill in the same thing, so we just use the um, emissions factor we're given, and it's the same with the working from home estimate. It's an estimate that they give us, and we just have to put in the full time equivalents and what percentage our staff work from home, and it comes up magically in the spreadsheet with a figure. So we are just using the um, generic emissions factor, if you like, that is supplied as part of that uh, reporting mechanism. OK, I don't see any other questions, um, so we move to the recommendations. One note, the report and the requ <laughs> the requirements of Nestrans and approve the proposed targets for Nestrans to reduce its emissions and work towards net zero emissions. Thank you. Uh, move on to 5.1 freight issues update, and that is by Paul Fitch. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, we were requested to bring a freight report to the board, and so in this board, this, this paper brings a general update of a, a range of different freight issues which are appropriate for the northeast of Scotland at the moment, uh, and is basically uh, uh, setting the agenda probably for a, a regional freight forum meeting which we hope to hold, hold uh, either later in this calendar year or at least within this financial year, depending on how quickly we can get the arrangements done. Um, the background, I set out there the uh, the policies that we have in our regional transport strategy and also in paragraph 2, too, just reinforcing the importance of freight and the whole logistics train, chain, dare I say, to the northeast of Scotland, particularly as we can be relatively peripheral to some of the import-export gateways and some of the main distribution hubs uh, in Scotland and the UK. And again, I think this was picked up in a recent Chamber of Commerce uh, newsletter saying how more vulnerable we might be to rising fuel costs in terms of overall inflation of goods and, and services. Um, I think I highlighted there that the way Nestrans uh, engages on freight issues on a range of different channels. We have a Scottish uh, meeting, Scott flag, with the Transport Scotland and Scottish Government and the freight industry. Uh, we also have uh, other opportunities, and one recently arose in terms of a meeting on about a proposed all-party parliamentary group, which I know Councillor Yule helpfully uh, attended, uh, as well as myself, as part of a wider UK uh, local government gathering. But we also maintain regular stakeholder contact with key regional players, such as the Port of Aberdeen, the Chamber of Commerce, Aberdeen International Airport, and, and, and a number of hauliers. Um, M most recent uh, policy position was perhaps come from the UK White Paper, which was published in the June 2022. And it's interesting the five key points that they were bringing through there about a national freight network. And again, that is something that Nestrans has historically tried to support through the previous work on trans-European networks, uh, although there is a current proposal to develop that that's come through the Union Connectivity Review. The next one was about enabling the transition to net zero, and that's pretty much about being more efficient, more efficient, but also uh, seeing if we can encourage pathways to low carbon vehicles or, or movement of freight. It could be rail freight, it could be electric vans, or you know, it could be the, the hydrogen lorries coming along as well. Uh, the DFT paper also noticed the importance of a a sympathetic planning environment, noting that for all the houses that you would grow, we, we, we are building. There also has to be a commensurate uh, investment in almost a retail warehousing to support the online uh, uh, delivery that we're, we're all now used to. Uh, there was a re recognition of the importance of having the right people, the right skills available to support the logistics industry. Recently, this was in the headlines around HGV drivers, but I'm in informed that that goes all the way through to warehousing skills uh, and, and that whole suite of, uh, of support uh, for, 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 for moving goods around the country. And also a point around data and technology as well. Uh, it's interesting that a number of these aspects were also picked up in the Northeast Green Freeport bid. 
we, we currently await the outcome of that, but there were several elements in there, which was about uh, training and skills, about uh, master plan consent areas, uh, and, and also about innovation, which also could be about that technological innovation. And I think logistics will be key to the success of uh, any green free port that is developed uh, in this area if it goes ahead. The next section of my report talks about rail freight, and it was very interesting that Rab talked about the presentation we had yesterday for network rail on the Aberdeen to Central Belt uh, improvement scheme. And it was certainly of interest that a lot of the members attending that picked up very much on this step change of improvement for the rail freight industry that would come about from that investment, both through the uh, signalling and, and the freight loop improvements, but also through the subsequent electrification of the line. Uh, there was a recent call for evidence for rail freight growth targets and the consultation response is included as an appendix to this paper. I would also say that the, uh, a, a city region deal strategic transport appraisal project is currently looking at opportunities for rail freight growth and the implications of that on key rail freight terminals, particularly at the, uh, to, the, to the south of Aberdeen, but not excluding other sites of interest. The next section I go on to talk a little about low carbon freight vehicles, uh, the importance of recognising that a lot of vans will probably be coming to the market soon and requiring electrical charging by the commercial operators and that might provide a challenge for the public sector charging network. Uh, but also uh, looking ahead to what the next stage of heavy goods vehicles might be coming onto the road that might be hydrogen and again referring to a project in the northeast green fruit green freeport bid around about hydrogen refueling not just in Aberdeen but trying to expand it regionally. On section six we refer to perhaps the micro logistics uh, on the e-cargo bikes and Nestrand's currently managing a fleet of six e-cargo bikes uh, given the opportunities to try before they buy in terms of zero emission uh, logistics it's been on the go now we, we've got those just where that COVID came in and it's been very interesting hearing the stories of how people have used them where they've been successful and perhaps where they haven't been as successful that's all relevant in terms of learning how these might be rolled out not only in Aberdeen but in other areas in the region across Scotland. Last mile logistics sounds simple but often it can be the most complicated element of the freight delivery chain as, as well so cargo bikes might not always be a universal fit for all situations but certainly there's been a number of successful applications where people have actually then gone on to purchase their own cargo bikes. Uh, Seafine being one of the examples where, where that has helped uh, significantly their operations. And finally, I've set out in, in, in Section 7 the proposals we've had for a freight forum. We've previously had this freight forum events on, on an annual basis. Uh, they, uh, we had a virtual one during the lockdown periods, but I think it's appropriate now that we look again due to the changing policy environment and the changing pressures on the logistics network to arranging uh, uh, another freight forum where perhaps some of these issues can be presented to the freight industry and perhaps that gives them an opportunity to influence our policy direction, but also any particular projects that we may wish be, uh, to be pursuing uh, as, as we go forward in this area. So the recommendations are to note the updates to rail, rail freight policy, uh, rail freight and low carbon logistics, Note the submission in response to the call for evidence on rail freight growth targets and also approve proposals for the hosting of a freight forum event uh, for regional stakeholders. Thank you, Chair. Um, Doreen. Thank you. Two points. Um, I noticed that it, there's a an FR3, the mode shift from uh, road to rail. However, in some places in the northeast, rail will not happen in the foreseeable future. So we must also concentrate on improving the road system to the ports of Fraserburgh and Peterhead, uh, especially within northeast green free port bed if it becomes successful. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, that's vitally important. And the second point I have is in 2.4 and I'm being slightly parochial here, but officers maintain regular stakeholder contact with key regional players, such as the Port of Aberdeen. Do you also keep in contact with the ports of Peterhead and Fraserburgh too?
Um, on the rail freight side of things and looking at the importance of road freight, uh, at the same time as us, as I talk about the study about rail freight terminals to the south of Aberdeen, we're also looking again at the evidence that supports uh, those strategic freight connections uh, on the road to both Fraserburgh and, and Peterhead around the Toll of Burness area and some of those key uh, pinch points or some of those actions are recognising the strategic importance of that freight connection to both uh, Peterhead uh, and, and Fraserburgh. Uh, and, and secondly, yes, uh, we, we uh, I'm sorry for missing out on, on, on Peterhead and Fraserburgh, but uh, we do maintain regular contact, particularly with Peterhead because they've been part of the, um, the Green Freeport proposals. Uh, but again, Fraserburgh is also vitally important in terms of the, uh, the, the fish processing and, and the fish industry there. And I think there were recent proposals around the um, the master planning work that they've been doing as well. I can just come back. We do have a renewables energy um, base in Fraserburgh now, so and it could grow. So I think just a bit more regular contact, please. It's a point well made. Thank you. Sandra. Thank you very much. I think it's welcome that we um, are going to um, pull together around a, a freight uh, forum. Um, just for my own personal understanding of, of some of the um, topics that we covered, I thought very helpfully at the meeting um, that, that, that Rab spoke to and, and, and Paul spoke about as well. I, I would like to see, um, being a geographer, I suppose, I'd like to see a map because um, I didn't quite understand where the freight loop is going to be at um, at the Montrose pinch point. And I, I also want to better understand the constraints around the depots. Um, um, you know, it was mention was made of, of needing more land space for, um, you know, the, the white vans that zip around with um, with goods going to people's houses. But there's also, if we're going to get more onto the, the rail, which I think is what we aspire to do, then we also will need more depots um, to service the communities, uh, the cities and, and the towns around. So I just... Um, it's just to better understand some of that at a very strategic level, um, although I do know there are some real people that like to get into a lot of detail about um, crossover points and gauntleting and things that, um, uh, that um, you know, come up in these conversations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, again, a, 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 a plan could be useful about where the existing rail freight terminals are and what their constraints are. We did some work about 10 years ago on this and uh, currently there's quite a lot of capacity in the terminals at the moment. Uh, but again, it's the case of if we do see that uplift, how is that going to be spread around and do we have the right facilities in the right locations? And if so, we need to be uh, at least planning for that now so we can understand the decisions that have to be made in terms of land use allocations or other potential opportunities that, that, that might arise. And yeah, crossovers and these are important because they can actually help get more out of the uh, effective track layouts can help you get more um, turnaround at these freight terminals as well. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I agree that that's an opportunity and perhaps that's something that if we have the freight forum, we could perhaps uh, invite the network rail colleagues to come up and provide some of these proposals or, or you know, so people can start thinking about that. Thank you. Through you, Chair, just just one little comment about yesterday. I was I was a little disappointed there was nobody from Transport Scotland there because I think it, it was that kind of meeting where there was, you know, real engagement from um, members of boards and 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 officers and so on. And I think that that was maybe an opportunity missed. Um, so just to say that really. Yeah, the, the, it was to be hosted by a member of the, the Transport Scotland team. Unfortunately, he had a domestic situation. But uh, yes, it's a point well made. And it's a point the RAB made immediately after the meeting as well to me. I said it would have been valuable to, to have had that. So perhaps we need to build in a bit more resilience because for, for that situation. But we'll certainly be reporting the back, the outcomes of that through Transport Scotland as well. I think it's a point well made. Uh, Councillor Sandra Radley. 
Take care. Um, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with um, Councillor Macdonald's comments about sort of being a bit more of a visual learner myself. Um, a map of what was discussed yesterday might actually be helpful just so that we get right in our heads what the what the proposals are coming forward um, ahead of us. I guess my comments around sort of modal shift, we're trying to encourage this modal shift away from roads and onto railway and with with sort of freight and um, and passenger transport, although the freight is the the topic that we're discussing at the moment, um, it would be good to understand what our capacity is if the modal shift does happen. Um, where we we talk about trying to encourage people in uh, into freight. I'm not coming across very well, but um, it would be good to know where our pinch points are um, in the city and wider across sort of the Nice Trans area, um, and see if there's you know. We can be a bit more proactive, you know, if people are going to move to freight, where are our pinch points and what what can we do to solve them problems? Thanks. I think the uh, the aspects around frail, rail freight would make a very good item for that uh, freight forum uh, discussion. Um, uh, uh, from previous work, there's a, a, a long chain of opportunities, but then there's a, a complex change of things that also have to change within the industry as well. Some of those physical manifestations of the track and the terminals, some of those are organisational as well. But I think it's important that we have, that's a, an opportunity to perhaps spend a bit more time if we had that freight forum and perhaps we can explain that and we can explore in more detail some of those ones. Okay, a quick apology, uh, Miranda, not Sandra. <laughs> Okay, um, there's no other questions. So we go to the recommendations one, two, and three, and to be approved. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 5.2 strategic active travel routes, and that's Paul again. Thank you very much, Chair. And again, this is another paper that had been requested for a couple of cycles. Uh, the purpose of the report is to update the board on progress and development and implementation of strategic stro active travel routes linking uh, Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire. Uh, it's been developed with the support of Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City colleague uh, officers. Uh, I guess there's three main elements to the report. The first one is just sets out the, the policy and the, the, the delivery responsibilities. The second one walks us through the uh, five the, the the five strategic routes and the uh for martin and buck and y and d side line in terms of where we are in terms of progress on those uh end-to-end -end, uh route compliant uh, um, routes and then the third section looks at some of the future opportunities that we need to build on in order to uh, achieve the delivery aspirations that we're all working to as well so in section two, I uh, outlined the uh, the five routes that are identified in the regional transport strategy, West Hill to Aberdeen, Inverurie to Aberdeen, Stonehaven to Aberdeen, Ellen to Aberdeen, and Bankery to Aberdeen. And we also, in policy A2, A uh, relates to the D-side way and the Full Martin and Buckham way, noting that the D-side way in part is in parallel with the, the Bankery to Aberdeen city corridor. Nestrans provides a regional liaison coordination role, facilitating links with organisations such as Sustrans, helping to secure funding for route improvement projects. Uh, delivery of the projects typically rests with the respective local authorities, who in most instances are the local roads authority or an instance of off-road path have responsibilities for maintenance and development of core paths under relevant access legislation. Section three takes us through each of those routes. Uh, West Hill to Aberdeen City Centre. There has been previous work, there is an existing path, there are some constraints on that existing path. Uh, a lot of work has been looked at in terms of the multi-corridor study, but uh, the target dates and the action dates are still pending the outcome of the, that multi-modal corridor study and then the development of projects that uh, will, will come out of that work. Between Inverurie and Aberdeen City Centre, 
uh, within the Aberdeenshire Council area. Initial phase of work has been completed between Inverurie and Kintore, and there's an active project looking at linking Kintore through to Blackburn. Between Blackburn and Dice Drive, uh, that currently falls on, or uh, the route is missing between uh, that uh, over the tyre bagger corresponding with the section next to the A96 trunk road. I, the Transport Scotland at the moment are still undertaking their review of options along the A96, so consideration of that is, is pending that. Subs sub subsequent route development has been undertaken between uh, Dice Drive and City Centre, uh, again captured on the A96 multimodal corridor study and aspects of the buried in corridor improvement as well. Between Stonehaven and Aberdeen City Centre, currently there is a circuitous uh, off on and off road link forming part of the national cycle network. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have any dedicated provision. Uh, there have been stretches of shared use cycle route installed between Hairness Roundabout and Old Wellington Road, as well as along North Esplanade West. Feasibility work is being progressed uh, by Aberdeenshire Council for, on the A92, working from the Aberdeen boundary southwards. Uh, there are designs for work in the Aberdeen City Council area, although that currently is undertaking a design review as well in terms of compliance to current standards. The Ellen to Aberdeen City Centre via Balmedi element. Again, there's no current currently there's no continuous route available, although sections of the route have off-road share path provision and there are bus cycle taxi lanes and off-road provision. Uh, in Aberdeenshire Council, feasibility work has been completed, a draft outline design has been developed, and now there is discussions ongoing with landowners and, and trying to program in the uh, delivery aspects of stages of that work. Within Aberdeen City area, uh, an, ab an outline design has been developed between Black Dog and Merca, but that is currently also subject to, to a design review. Sections between Bridge of Don and City Centre are being captured as part of, now the report says, the A96 multimodal corridor study. I can apologise, that should state the A956 Ellen to Garth D multimodal corridor study. Between Bankery, Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Centre Centre, and I've wrapped in the D-side line and the D-side way on, on this as well. So the principal provision on that line is the D-side line and the D-side way, forming a continuous route between Bankery and Aberdeen. Although, the, <coughs> sorry, section between Duffy, Duffy Park and Peter Cooter is off-road and surfaced. The sections between Peter Cooter and Drum Oak use minor roads and paths and tracks across a variety of surfaces and is more suited to leisure activity. The section between Bankery and Drum Oak regains the alignment of the former railway, although it is not surfaced. There are advisory on-road cycle lanes present on sections of the A93 between Peter Cooter and Aberdeen City Centre. The first stage of the A93 multimodal corridor study was recently presented for consultation, and that will be the main vehicle by which further improvements to the route will be identified. On the Full Martin and Buckham Way, which again provides a continuous off-road route between Dye Station and to Newmacker, moored onwards to Stricken Fraserburgh alongside and Peterhead. It is surfaced between Dice and Park Hill and within the built-up area of Ellen. A review was undertaken in 2022, identifying the requirement to remove physical access barriers to make the route uh, available for access for all, which in some instances that these barriers do prohibit access for many sections of our community, including those with pushchairs or with specially adapted bikes or, or wheelchairs. Work is continuing to ongoing. Uh, weak bridges along the route as well where they're failing and we need to uh, commit to the continuation of the route. The next steps on that line are the ongoing br bridge replacement programme and uh, programming of works to remove access barriers, although that is still subject to discussions with uh, Aberdeen Shire Council's uh, or, uh, or paths team. In terms of the future development opportunities, I, in, in 4.1, the status review clearly demonstrates that despite strategic alignment on priorities across the region, project progression and delivery is uneven. Council officers have cited resourcing pressures and competing delivery priorities as a root cause of this situation. 
Looking forward, there are a number of developments that provide opportunities to address these issues at a national and a regional level. First of all is the significant funding that the Scottish Government have committed to active travel infrastructure and the graph uh, I think ably demonstrates the, the growth nationally in terms of that funding opportunity you know, going forward. Transport Scotland are also in the midst of an active travel transformation project recognising some of the constraints of affected local authorities in the uh, effective delivery of strategic active travel routes. And they're looking at how best they can maximise the opportunities given this commitment for increasing the funding, recognising that increasing the funding is only one mechanism and that um, all parties have to be very focused on that delivery pathway of how we can uh, change the funding availability through to projects on the ground. The workshops and Estrans and officers with councils have attended uh, workshops for this active, uh, the, the, the active travel transformation project, highlighting the importance of there being multi-year funding uh, certainty, uh, revenue as well as capital funding, noting that some of the projects uh, are more suited to revenue rather than capital, and also on how best uh, to achieve effective delivery mechanisms and perhaps delivery teams uh, within within the councils, trying to make sure that resource is almost ring-fenced for the operationalisation of, of active travel delivery, thinking that's probably what is required to do. We note that Transport Scotland's second strategic transport STPR2 strategic transport projects review included proposals for a series of active travel freeways uh, in, in the North East, but in and around Aberdeen uh, that was put on a par with it at Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, the concept as described corresponds closely to the vision set out in the RTS for the strategic cycle routes. And again, designation or support from Transport Scotland may actually further support the delivery imperative for these routes. Nestrans receives grant funding every year from Sustrans to support the work of the Active Travel Delivery Officer, uh, John Barron here. Uh, this financial year, it's a supporting a proposal to commission work on the development of a strategic active travel network for the region, identifying routes, priorities, appropriate delivery pathways and funding opportunities with that supporting appropriate evidence. Uh, this work will be progressed, progressed in close liaison with officers of both local authorities, recognising that officers in the City Council have also received a similar, to in, a similar instruction to develop a citywide active travel plan. Uh, uh, and both local authorities are at this time undertaking work on their respective local transport strategies, which we've been pleased to support as they've gone through that process. And finally, the above work, the above technical work complements the review and update of Nestrans Active Travel Plan, which we've recognised as a priority over the com coming 12 months. This action plan needs to be accompanied by a governance structure that matches other regional action plans, such as the bus action plan, the health and transport action plan, etc., such that there is improved oversight and reporting of the progression of the key priorities and actions across both of the authorities. So we have that joined up look at things at a senior level. Accordingly, officers will consult with local authority or partners on the most appropriate and effective structure and remit, bringing a paper back to the board on these proposals at the soonest opportunity, and I hope that would be in the new year. In terms of the recommendations, it's re recommended that the board, one, notes the current policy, delivery responsibilities for strategic cycle routes in the Nestrans area. Secondly, notes the current status, progress, next steps and timelines for the five identified strategic routes and development proposals for the full Martin and Buchan line by and the D side line. It notes future opportunities arising for the delivery of strategic routes with increased funding, a national review of delivery mechanisms and regional work on active travel planning. And finally, approves the implementation of improved regional governance arrangements for the Active Travel Action Plan, with the director reporting back on firm proposals following consultations with partner local authorities and other key stakeholders. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'm happy to take uh, questions on this paper. Boring. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if the officer is aware of the coastal paths projects that are ongoing in Aberdeenshire at the moment. Um, we have a very, uh, these are run by community groups. I haven't seen anything in here about, you know, liaison with community groups to help to deliver this. Um, we have one just now between Fraserburgh and the villages of Invercairn and Cairnbulg 
which is fairly well de delivered, <laughs> developed, and it'll deliver an active travel route, which will be absolutely first class um, going forward. So I just wondered if there'd been any work done on that. Thank you. Um, I'm aware of the work on the coastal path and the, the, the work the offices have been doing, uh, and Nestrans are funding a review of core paths as well in, in the Aberdeenshire area, although I think we're doing that on an area by area basis. So we have had previous correspondence with, 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 with that proposal. I guess the request for this report was to focus specifically on those Aberdeen city to Aberdeenshire or those commuter routes as well, although I do believe that our regional transport strategy does pick up on those, that, that coastal path things. I know that Councillor Cox has also been very keen on some of those aspects in his area as well, so we are aware of that indeed, although for this work I focus on those radial routes coming out of the city centre, but thank you for that point. Isabel. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's really good to see all this stuff coming forward, and um, you know it's very welcome. It would be also good to get those city connections. It's really important that we're able to um, to join up with the city. And I wonder if there's any date set for the completion of the design review and then the forward planning after that. I think we need a bit more, um, you know, to be a bit firmer with expectations and to be able to, to complete those areas. Yes, I recognise that requirement and I recognise the need for that as well. I don't know if David has, David Dan can assist me with, 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 with anything on that point. Uh, thank you, through you Chair. Yeah, ha happy to assist. Um, Mr. Finch, um, so the design, there are a whole series of design reviews associated with the, the bus partnership fund project and a whole series of gate checks that um, we have to go through for a number of those projects. So th that is an ongoing piece of work that will, I'm going to say, continue over the next few years. But really into the middle of next year, we should see a number of those reach a stage where we move on to design, um, detailed design for design implementation. So there's consultation work has been going on over the, the last couple of months in terms of each of those multimodal corridor studies. Um, in parallel to that, there are a range of smaller projects or at least projects which aren't part of, of the BPF that um, Mr. Finch has noted. Um, for example, sections associated with the AWPR uh, and the, the benefits from the AWPR. Those pieces of work are, are also ongoing at the moment. And indeed, we met with the AW, AWPR's managing agent um, only last week, in fact, earlier this week, um, to discuss some of those um, routes. There are some uh, complications with those. The Scottish Government's guides uh, in terms of cycling standards, cycling by design, has changed in the recent past. That has meant that things like shared use paths have fallen out of favour. That does mean that we've got to go back and revisit some of those um, routes. And in some cases, that does mean that we will um, have to um, purchase um, land in order to make those routes viable. So that's the, I'm going to say, the projects that are ongoing. So that you will see progress on those over the coming uh, weeks, months, uh, and into next year, and then delivery um, subsequent to that. In terms of the other piece of work that, um, uh, that Mr. Finch noted in terms of a cycling strategy or a wider active travel strategy. That's something that we're we're um, about to start here in the city uh, and we'll be working with colleagues in Aberdeenshire because obviously it's a, it's a network uh, basis. Uh, and in parallel to that, we're both working on our um, on our uh, local transport strategies, which again, um, I'm going to say will be coming to fruition over the next 12 months um, or so. Uh, but we, we, we will be able to report back on those at relevant stages as we move forward. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, thanks. Uh, good to see this, this report and uh, it's, it's good that uh, David mentioned the uh, uh, cycling by design document. The first bit of the report, I've, I've got a couple of bits and pieces, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, the first bit of the report mentions about West Hill to Aberdeen City Centre, Inverurie to Aberdeen City Centre, Stonehaven to Aberdeen City Centre, Ellen to Aberdeen City Centre, and Bankery to Aberdeen City Centre. And the, the key part of that to me in all of that is it goes to the city centre. 
Now, I know there's consultations going on, but at the city centre just now, it doesn't meet the requirements of the cycling by design. It doesn't really meet the requirements of what we've said was in the, in the master plan, Aberdeen was going to be a, a cycling city, as we're going against policy and having buses mingling with cyclists. And it's not really making that an area that anybody would want to go or anybody knew that would want to go to cycle. I, I accept that maybe some hardened cyclists, uh, delivery type driver, uh, cyclists, etc., will still use that as a, as a corridor. But are we are we are we saying that the the proposals that are in place just now are going to actually deliver what we want this to be Aberdeen City Centre to be a destination for all these these uh, these corridors? I don't know who that's too like. <laughs> David, will I come back? Oh, it's maybe not one to speak. Did. No, no, uh, apologies. <laughs> um, I just can't get my camera back on. Um, I think it's important to see the colour in my eyes. Um, obviously, we we have met only recently um, to do, to discuss this. I suppose I don't I don't want to necessarily go through the entire meeting and the discussions that were had, um, but I, I I don't really have much um, Colin to to add to what we discussed on that at that time. Like as I say, we've got constraints in the city centre. They're they're very real constraints, um, and you're aware of what they are. We've made great strides in terms of the bus priority measures that we're introducing at the end of the year to try and reduce car traffic in the in the city centre uh, and make the entire um, environment safer. It's obviously a, a low speed, um, a low speed network. And if you apply certain, certainly certain elements of cycling by design in terms of the, the level of traffic, it does paint a slightly different picture. But I, I, I accept the position that, that you have on it and I don't, I wouldn't disagree with that position. But obviously we, we, we've got a committee instruction in terms of Union Street, uh, in terms of how we, we are to proceed, i.e. to open it back up to um, to public transport. Uh, and they are the constraints that that we then have to operate uh, within. Uh, like I think, as as we discussed on that day, we are, you know, somewhat unusual in the sense that Union Street is effectively a second bus station um, within the, the the city centre of Aberdeen, and it's got a, a huge number of of bus stops on it. And that's the nature of the of the sort of network that we have. So we we will have to look at solutions to that. But I I can't give you those solutions right now because, as I say, they they haven't been worked up. Yes, thank you. And and I know that the consultation is ongoing and there are dis discussions on, ongoing on that. But it's just everybody should know that this is not an ideal situation for anybody on on that. So that was my first point. Sorry. Um, second point was. Again, about Black Dog uh, and, and Marker. Uh, note, note that they're saying that there's uh, it's currently subject to design review. Um, does that mean that it, the, it started again? I think we got a, an email a, a few months ago saying that, that 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 project had actually halted for a while. Yeah, ha happy to come in on that one. Um, so that project had been a design had been worked up for that project, uh, and we were about to move forward uh, prior to. Um, prior to COVID uh, and then subsequently, uh, obviously the spaces for people and then um, now the bus partnership fund, which has come along. The, we passed the project over to one of our uh, delivery teams, um, Alan McKay's team within Capital. However, as I mentioned, the cycling by design has changed and, and moved away from shared, um, shared use spaces. So the question is now asked about whether sections of that path which were i'm going to try to say working within the context of the sort of landscape that we had out there and um, whether they would still be fundable or supportable by you know transport scotland but indeed by the awpr in terms of um as those funders if if it is a case that we need to widen that path which i i think being honest might be the case then it will have um land implications and we'll have to see you know what what the opportunities are to um engage with landowners out there to see um whether we can make that route work in the same way that we had or whether it will it will have to alter so as i say we we've we met with the management agent for the awpr earlier this week um, and uh, work is underway to 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 look at a solution for that 
Thank you, David. Thank you. Sorry. Next one. I've only got a couple more. It's all right. Um, I, was, I was really pleased that the barrier removal work has been identified on, on, on this. That, that's key for the for Martin and Buck and Way. Um, I had personal experience with myself having to uh, cycle with, with somebody in an adaptive bike and having four people to have to lift this person up and their bike over a, a barrier. Um, the, 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 the bit that I think was missing on this, uh, I, I would like to to know if there was any discussions about resurfacing. Uh, the particular parts of, of for Martin and Buck and Way are really bad to cycle on. Um, I know some work was done on D-side last in the previous years. Um, was there any, anything coming up on recycling, resurfacing, not recycling, resurfacing? I, I am not aware of anything in the current capital plan on, John's going to help me now. Yes, we chair. There's nothing, um, pardon the pun, concrete um, as far as um, surfacing. However, such strands have or are injecting um, significant funds onto the Vermont and Buckingham Way um, this year for a number of the programmes that have been mentioned earlier. Um, that's part of a long term aspiration for the entire route to be rebadged as National Cycle Network Route 1. So, with that, will become um, surfacing drainage access issues will hopefully all resolved before it can be rebadged. So that's approaching. Um, that will be happening in the next year to a couple of years um, along its entirety. Thanks, John. Last last bit on this. Um, just uh, uh, the chart about the Scottish Government investment is, is, is really good, um, showing it shooting up. Um, the last couple of years we've had about 100 million investment and active travel on that. How much of that is, has come through to uh, uh, our areas? Yes, that's a very good question, Colin. Uh, John's done some work on this. Uh, John, perhaps you might be able to uh, provide a breakdown of those couple of those figures. Um, those that know me will know that I tend not to give short answers, but the short answer is not enough. Um, next week, it will be my fifth birthday with Nestrand. During that time, Community Links now places for everyone, um, which is the main funding stream for infrastructure projects. Um, we haven't had enough in the northeast. That'd be safe to say. Um, in the past three years, places for everyone has been a pot of eighty-five million pounds, and of that pot, in the past three years, the city has had one percent. And Aberdeenshire has had 0.11% of that pot, whereas other local authorities or one local authority has had 40% of that pot. And over half the local authorities in Scotland have also had less than 1%. However, that is the main funding stream. Um, more recently, um, during the pandemic, Spaces for Everyone, yeah, Spaces for People, which is the temporary infrastructure, there was also a pot created. Um, during that, the city got just over 4% of the pot that was available, and the Aberdeenshire was less than a percent. So um, that, I think, evidence is that, no, we haven't had enough. If you use a rudimentary 10% of the population live in the northeast, we haven't had that in my five years or before. So, sorry, so does, does that mean is we we haven't asked for it, or we haven't received it, or you know what, or we don't have the project. We haven't looked at projects to do this. Or through you, chair, others in the room, perhaps, and and online will perhaps um, better evidence this. But I can only speak from my own experience. Um, it's all of the all that you've said, and perhaps more. Um, we need to apply in the first instance. We haven't applied enough, and that's clear if you look at the. Records. So there's 300, 320 million coming up in 24-25. So I think we hopefully get a better percentage than that. Thank you. That's that's all my questions. Uh, Sandra. Thank you very much. My question too was around the um, graph at, at 4.2 because I think it's important to understand um, how much of this is capital and, and coming back to Colin's point about resurfacing, um, you know, th there 
whenever capital goes in, there there are always going to be revenue costs associated with that. And it's just, um, you know, to, to better understand what what funding streams are coming through, both to um, sustain any capital um, expenditure that we have. I think it's really, um, you know, it's good to see that all these projects are, are, are being progressed. But I, at some point, they keep on leapfrogging over each other and, and, and goalposts are changed. And so they need to be redesigned and all the rest. And at some point, you know, we're going to have to make decisions about what we are going to invest in first. And, and, and I don't I don't have a sense yet that um, we're at that point. And, and I think there, there is an edge of frustration uh, creeping in uh, around, you know, where, where there's going to be, where this is going to go. A lot of work is going into, um, you know, the, the, the putting these on the table. And it's, a, it's around expectation as well, I think, because it is a double edged sword. Um, the expectation of getting really excellent um, active travel corridors and uh, getting more people onto public transport and having more people using bikes is an aspiration. But we need to recognise that that is going to be taking road space away from others. And, and you know, that that conversation has to be out there and, and tough decisions are going to have to be made. And, um, you know, we can talk and talk and talk, but we need some at some point to decide and to act. And I think, um, you know, um, we're, we're still waiting on that a little bit. It was more of a rant than a question, I have to say. Just to come into that, Chair, in um, Paul's report, he mentions about Transport Scotland are being in the midst of an active travel transformation project. I attended the recent workshop in Glasgow on behalf of Nestrans, and I can assure you the entire room, which was lots of local authorities, Sustrans, everyone really involved in active travel in Scotland um, was in that room and we were very much of one voice that we need multi-year um, funding, it needs to be capital and revenue funding and that was a message that was very loud and clear to both the Minister who was present and uh, Transport Scotland as well. So we've certainly done our campaigning shall we say and um, made that point that it can't just be capital funding and it can't be single year funding because then it means that it's very difficult for us to apply and implement things it has to be multi-year and it has to be capital and revenue so they're certainly the messages that we're sending to Transport Scotland as part of this transformation to allow us to be able to apply for more in the future. Okay thank you uh, Glenn. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, Paul, thanks very much for this uh, this paper. Uh, quite a few of the questions I was going to ask have been asked already, so I'll keep it as brief as I can. John, uh, read the for Martin Buchan line. In the answer to, I think it was Colin, you said uh, resurfacing starting within one to two years. For that whole line to be resurfaced, what's our aim? So if we are actually going to be on site uh, within like one to two years, when are we actually aiming to have it completed? I don't know if that's been decided yet or not, but we we get a lot of questions about this from uh, local members. Through you, Chair, um, there isn't a, a definitive end date of Astro One. Um, however, if if I could use the um, improvements and upgrades that were made to the D sideways as an example, they were done in a relatively um, quick, certainly by some of the other studies on this paper um, time frame. Um, they were done within a calendar year. So that was um, at most six certain sections um, of the D side way were done. Um, yes, the from Martin Buckingham way is um, slightly longer and access to some of the aspects of where it goes um, causes further complications to that D side way. It was slightly easier, um, but there is a buy in from Sustrans. There's a buy in from Aberdeenshire Council colleagues to um, have this work expedited and as the graph and that shows the if we um make a relevant and decent pitch for it which i'm more than happy to and i've done that in the past few years um, we can have our slice of the cake so that we can have this done within um i would like to put um behind the time frame now but i'll be like to be put if it's not the next calendar year it would be um the year after that that it can be rebadged and before sustrans are happy to rebadge it the standard has to be brought up so that it can be fully accessible when um, the hideous barriers that are there that prevent access to so many need to be removed and it needs to be um, 
open to all to, to use it. Thanks, John. That's quite impressive. Uh, the second point is it's really for uh, the officer that answered uh, Councillor Davidson's uh, questions about dates, etc. It's really good to see this paper. I asked for this paper to come along because I really wanted to see a proper overview, a strategic overview of all the routes that are coming in. I am disappointed that uh, some of the dates aren't in there. Uh, it's the city section, Stonehaven to Aberdeen route and Ellen to, uh, to Aberdeen as well. Now, you alluded that there were uh, some studies going on, etc. So could you possibly tell us when we could reasonably expect to have dates for this? Because members of the public keep asking us as to you know, what's happening, where, we, where are we with it? So we've got the overall picture of where we're going, et cetera. It would be nice also to have maps as well, so we can actually easily explain to people where we're actually going with it. But when can we actually have dates, uh, you know, at the conclusion of these uh, studies where we can say, these are our target dates, this is what we're working towards, this is achievable, we might not hit it, but we're working towards this. So it's really key. Uh, a lot of people are asking about this. And Dave is coming back in. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, so it, it, it is a little bit complicated. I can certainly come back in the next, um, I would say in the next couple of months, early next year at the latest, um, with a sense of, of the timeline. The complication, as I um, mentioned to Colin earlier, is around what needs to be done. So if you, if you take both both corridors that you've just mentioned, both of them have elements of shared use um, surface on them. Those elements are unlikely to be successful in terms of um, any sort of funding uh, and wouldn't comply with cycling by design. So the question is, if, if that involves land purchase, then that makes it considerably longer. If it doesn't involve land purchase, then it can probably be done significantly quicker. The piece of work that needs to be undertaken in the first instance is to look at the two scheme designs as currently as they sit to see how much of the route would be affected by that and therefore what is the likely impact in sort of in, in terms of timing. So as I said, we, we met with the management agent from the AWPR who was comfortable um, as we explained it. Um, and certainly within the city, we have um, a team within Capital who are now looking um, to do that piece of work. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to speak to them in terms of what the implications are on, on timing because they've got a considerable amount of uh, other projects ongoing at the moment, as indeed do my teams with the uh, Bus Partnership Fund. Jen, we just come back, yeah. So would it be possible then to ask for this paper to come back early next year with the dates? And if, it, if things aren't clarified at that point, we can maybe have two dates, e.g. Uh, if we have to go land purchase, it'll be this date. If we don't go a uh, land purchase, it'll be that date. And then if we could include maps as well, so it makes it easy for people to visualise where, you know, where these are, uh, strategic routes are going, etc. So is that possible? Uh, through you, Chair. Yeah, I can certainly, in terms of coming back with a programme, that's not a that's not a difficulty. Uh, I won't be able to say uh, at that stage whether uh, if, if land purchase is required, whether that, what the timeline would be for that, purely because if you get land purchase by agreement, that's a relatively short process. If we have to go down the CPO route, that's a considerably difficult uh, and more complex process. But we can we can explain that within the report. Yeah, I'm happy to bring back a, a, a report early in the in the new year, certainly on on updates, um, taking this report and and moving it forward. Yeah, yeah, take that point as well. Chair, yeah, if I can, sorry. It was just, it, just for a point of clarification for board, as we mentioned a couple of times now, there are plenty of examples of shared use paths in the rural environment that will and are being funded by Places for Everyone. It's incorrect to say that shared use in the rural context won't be funded by Sustrans and Places for Everyone. It's being now, today, and has been in recent years. Okay, thanks. Can I just go back on that one as well? You were saying we won't get the funding if all these gates are not taken away. And, and... I wouldn't think for a minute, Chair, that we will. Why, why should we when we're, um, as it's been for 40 years, not accessible to anyone or to everyone, sorry. So um, I wouldn't think for a minute that we would get the funding if the gates aren't removed. Um, there, are, there are still some barriers near some of the um, faster, busier 
um, A-class crossings, that there will still, still need to be some barriers. Um, so I'm not saying that there will be a, an absolute wholesale removal of every single barrier on the line. However, in the main, and I think many of you who, who um, live and work near the, the line will know of many of them, that they are there. there's no legitimate reason for any of them to be there anymore. Um, and that reasons haven't existed for a long time. So um, sometimes we wouldn't find that, um, and rightly so. Right, there's no other questions. So um, we'd go to the recommendations, except um, recommendation one, two, three, and four. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to 6.1 bus action plan update, and that's Kirsty Chalmers. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this report really was just brings a couple of different, a couple of bus issues under the heading of the bus action plan, and gives an update on recent activities under Aberdeen Rapid Transit, and also a proposal around um, the contribution to a new rural transport office officer post within Aberdeenshire Council. Um, just as a quick reminder, the North East Bus Alliance, which was established in 2018, is a partnership between Nest Trans, Aberdeen City Council, first Aberdeenshire Council, first in Aberdeen, and Stagecoach Bluebird and Baines Coaches. Um, one of the key functions of the Bus Alliance um, is to develop and deliver a bus action plan, um, which was first published in, in back in 2020 and provides a rolling programme of actions against all of the partners of the Alliance. Um, and this is uh, reviewed and updated by the Bus Alliance on a, on a regular basis. Um, the Bus Alliance Executive is currently working to update, review and update the Bus Action Plan. Um, it, it contains a, a whole range of actions um, under a number of headings, including uh, improving journey times and reliability, information, marketing and promotion, fares and ticketing, affordability and accessibility, interchange, bus stop infrastructure and the quality of the fleet. And as I said, it contains actions in there against all, um, all partners of the Alliance. Uh, also contained within the bus action plan are all of the multimodal corridor studies that we've al already um, discussed, the, particularly the bus elements of those, um, some, of the, some of which are funded through the bus partnership fund, um, some of which are being funded by Nestrans. Um, as I, as I mentioned, the Bus Alliance are currently update, reviewing and updating the bus action plan, and it is the intention to report this back to the board um, at its December meeting. Robert Andrew, who is the chair of the North East Bus Alliance, he's an independent chair, um, he recently made a presentation to Aberdeenshire Council's um, Infrastructure Services Committee, which I think was well, well received. Um, and a similar invitation has been extended for him to come and present and discuss the work of the Bus Alliance at the board meeting. Um, and it's expected that, we'll, that this will uh, take place in December. He's confirmed he's available for that. Um, and so that, together with the Bus Action Plan, would allow a bit of a focus on bus issues um, at the next meeting. Um, Aberdeen Rapid Transit, um, as we reported back in September, um, it's being progressed through a number of consultancy commissions. Um, key activities um, that have commenced since the last, last meeting primarily really include the testing of potential ART network under a number of different scenarios um, using the recently completed ASAM 19 model. Um, and the results of this are being used by the consultants to feed into the detailed options appraisal and will give an indication of things like appropriate routing options for ART, bus journey times and the impact on conventional buses, indications of potential patronage levels, um, impact on car journeys and impact on park and ride occupancies. Um, Stantec, who are undertaking that work, will be doing a series of panel surveys during November um, on some of the um, options coming out of that study and the intention is that a detailed options appraisal would come back to the Nest Trans Board at the February meeting next year, including the results of that ASAM testing. On ART again, we've got a, um, a, a councillor briefing scheduled for Monday on uh, Aberdeen Rapid Transit. That is a virtual briefing um, for all councillors of Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire um, and that will be on Monday afternoon. Um, and we've also agreed a date um, with colleagues in Belfast for a delegation from the board to visit Bel the Belfast Glider. And that is taking place on the 21st and 22nd of November. The um, on, on the uh, issue of the Rural Transport Officer post, um, back at the last meeting in September, the board received a report which provided um, findings for the evaluation of the um, ready to go around in Vruri digital demand responsive transport pilot project. Um, and highlighted the next steps that Aberdeenshire Council are taking with that, which includes a 12 month extension to the pilot. Um, in order to address some of the resourcing issues um, and also a desire to, to, to do more to seek additional funding streams for us for these types of projects, um, Aberdeenshire Council is seeking to recruit a rural transport officer. 
the council is currently going through the required internal processes for that and have and a request has been made to Nestrans to provide some financial support to that post. Um, so the proposal here is that Nestrans make a financial contribution from within the already approved bus action plan revenue budget towards this post. Um, and it's proposed that that be on a two year fixed term basis, uh, be a 50% contribution from Nestrans and a 50% from Aberdeenshire Council. It would fall under the man, the post would fall under the management of Aberdeenshire Council's public transport unit um, with tasks um, recognising the sort of regional and cross boundary elements of the issue so that those learnings can be made, you know, can be can be had across the region. Um, although I think there's still some work to be done to sort of fully confirm the costs for the full financial year, the implication, I think the financial implication would be £20,000 from a Nest Trans perspective. Uh, that being 50% um, of the post um, and for the current financial year, assuming a commencement post in January, it would be a 5,000 contribution this this financial year from, as I said, the already agreed bus action plan, bus uh, budget heading. So as I said, it, that can be met from the existing approved budget, but the recommendation is that Nestrans consider the request for match funding um, in the years 23, 24 and 24, 25 and the details of those um, costs um, are in the report. Um, so the recommendations of the report are to note the intention to bring back a report on the Bus Alliance Action Plan to the meeting in December um, in support of a presentation by Robert Andrew, to note the progress on Aberdeen Rapid Transit and to agree to commit funding from future revenue budgets to contribute to a two year rural transport officer post. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. OK, I don't see any questions, so we move to the recommendations to accept and note um, recommendations on one, two and three. Thank you. Moving on to 6.2, Health and Transport Action Plan, review of action plan and update. And I believe Paul is presenting that. Well, thank you very much, Chair. This is just a brief report uh, highlighting some of the background actually to the Health and Transport Action Plan and uh, how it is established. I think this is the first time that the new board has uh, considered a report on the Health and Transport Action Plan. And, and I think uh, it is good that uh, Jerry is here as, as the uh, representative from, from, from the Health Board on, on the Nair Strands Board as well. Uh, we have a, supported a, a full-time programme manager. Unfortunately, he can't be here today to present this, so I, I, I'm doing it in his stead. Uh, the HTAP steering group is beyond uh, Aberdeen City. It is beyond Nestrans and NHS Grampian. It includes three local authorities, Aberdeen City, Aberdeen Shire, and the Murray Council as well. Uh, we have involvement from Scottish Ambulance Sector, uh, Ab Aberdeen, sorry, Scottish Ambulance Service, third sector uh, bodies as well, uh, health and social care partnerships, uh, the University of Robert Golden's uh, Community Transport Association, uh, and a wide range of other elements, including Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. And also in the past year, we've had uh, support from the Scottish Government from the, from the health side of things as well. So it's a fully inclusive partnership, and it, we primarily are looking at access to health, uh, but also the, uh, the issues of related to health and transport uh, together. We've committed to doing a review of the current action plan that was uh, it produced in 2000, 2008. It was uh, endorsed in 2008. A review was undertaken in 2013. It, uh, it, it pretty much expired just as COVID hit us in 2020. And since then, the work of the partnership, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the year or two, had been focused on those immediate priorities of responding to, 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 to COVID uh, and, the, and those actions around that. Uh, it's now opportune to uh, go forward with the review of the action plan and the updating of it as well, recognising the whole range of issues that have, have, have taken forward since 2013, including the creation of the health and social care partnerships, all the way down to the future proposals for a national care service as well, which is also impacting that organisational change of how health is delivered uh, in this country as well. Uh, the review includes a critical review, a couple of workshops, drafting review and, and approval of that action plan, hoping to have that uh, majority of the work undertaken 23-24 uh, financial year. 
An annual report has been produced as well for the previous financial year, 21-22, and currently that will, that will shortly be circulated amongst all the partnership for comments, including the Nestrans board, and we'll be seeking approval at the next HTAP steering group meeting in November 22. Thereafter, we'll bring it back to the Nestrans board for their noting as well. I'd highlight that we're, there is a, a Grampian Volunteer Transport Awards uh, ceremony uh, are being made for early December as well, and we've had these on a number of occasions, trying really to uh, highlight and, and the role of volunteer uh, workers in terms of providing community transport, uh, in terms of assisting communities and access to, to, to health as, as well. So the recommendation is to approve the proposal set out for the review and the update of the health and transport plan and note the progression of the 2021 annual report and the Grampian Volunteer Transport Awards. Thank you, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Glenn. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Paul. I'm not too sure where this fits in with this, but uh, there's lots of like uh, rural pressures with access and medical, uh, well, services in the in the Shire, etc. In my own ward, for instance, Stagecoach have just cut the bus service from Kintour to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Uh, there's been ongoing for a long time. Newmarker, there's no health facility in Newmarker, so they have to go to Dice. Uh, elderly people have to take two buses. They have to go into Dice and then you know, hang around there and then catch a connecting one. So I don't know where it fits in, but this is a review just now. Uh, so can that be included into looking at the, uh, the the rural communities that are dependent on services out with them or, or at a distance and having to connect uh, two buses or whatever? So I mean, is that a possibility? Absolutely, it's uh, one of the one of the things that the subgroup that I chair look at a lot in in terms of the, the, those access access to healthcare opportunities. Um, if there were a simple answer that that would have would have happened, but again, it is sometimes down to detail. Sometimes it's about discussions with the 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 the, the, um, the commercial bus operators. Sometimes it's about how we can work best with the voluntary sector, and sometimes as well, it's about some of the innovation that we've already talked about with the likes of the, the ready to go type of pilot as well. That rural transport officer post. There's a whole web of opportunities in there, but also there's the opportunities that arise from not having to travel to the, your doctor's appointment as well, or how that doctor's appointment or, or specialist appointment could be uh, delivered in, in, in an alternative manner as well. So there's a there's a whole agenda there which needs to be addressed, and I think the points you raise are appropriate to be raised in that forum, Councillor Reid. If I just jump in again, yeah, uh, a lot of the issues are actually elderly people. So even though a lot of the surgeries are going online just now, except for elderly people struggle with this. So they they tend to always go for the traditional, you know, as you go face to face and see your doctor, or get driven, you know, get driven by somebody. I spoke to our IGB representative last term that was in uh, a councillor and asked about there was proposed uh, super practices uh, coming to the city and it was going to be uh, looking at one in the north which would incorporate DICE and a few other places. Is it possible that more consideration can be given that wherever if, if we do proceed with these kind of things wherever we actually locate them it is on one direct bus route from you know from everybody that would actually be uh, needing to access that because they said at that time, the response was, uh, as long as it's accessible by a bus or you know, by any kind of bus service, e.g. just the same again, you could take two buses or three buses. It should be, if you're going to build a new uh, surgery, it should be a direct link to all the communities that are actually needing to access those services. I'll make a brief response back. I think that Jerry wants to come in on this point as well, but just uh, say that I, I appreciate that, 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 that sentiment and the requirement for that. And we've su recently supported some of the option selection for future healthcare facilities in terms of uh, that public transport mapping. So we can have that understanding of when choices are made, what impact that's having on the, on the public transport network. But I believe that for the chair, Mr. Donald would like to come in at this point. Yes, Jerry. Jerry was like, okay. Um, I, I, I don't wish to be flippant, but to get uh, one location that's going to serve all the communities it serves is, is, is quite challenging. Um, we are not just dependent on the commercial bus route operators. We're working very closely with volunteer organisations. That's why we've um, arranged a volunteer drivers award in order to try and attract more people into that area to support local communities that don't have any commercial bus uh, operations. So we're trying to do as much as we can in that regard. 
services themselves, unfortunately, um, is, is challenging. Uh, we, we are quite a bit away, I, I think, from the super centres that you refer to. Um, the availability um, of healthcare professionals is also a challenge in terms of how and where we can provide services, but we're prepared to work with communities as best as we can in order to get the right fix, um, but it may not suit everybody. Thank you. Yes, Sandra. I guess it's a same plea um, as Glenn from a citywide experience. Um, you know, we are seeing a reduction in in, in bus routes, um, particularly um, mentioning the the 888 from from Bridge of Dawn. We've you know is the more recent one, which is out at the moment, and and there is real concern about people getting access to the appointments that that they need um, to get to, and and we know that there is latent demand in, in the whole. NHS um, system and and it's not clear um, whilst there is a drive towards uh, you know digital this and digital that um, we're nowhere near being able to um, to um, get people to do that and and it's absolutely the case as Glenn said that particularly older people still want to go um, and and there is that transition time so I. I too am concerned and, and you know, welcome this review. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think we all need to feed in from our communities um, uh, into the review and to make it work and to get all those, um, um, you know, thoughts um, uh, tabled about uh, what can and can't be done. But I think um, I think there's a realism as well there about um, about the expectation and 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 also what what can be achieved with um with with the funding that there is available so um pleased to see this report and and, uh, and hopefully um see it um progressing as it goes through okay that's no more questions on that so we move to the the recommendations approve and note uh, points one and two Thank you. Um, we now move on to the progress report. There's um, no representation on this, so it's just any questions. Colin. Um, yeah, just uh, on page 76 about get about. Um, it's, it's not a question, it's just uh, um, just like everybody to know that the Get About Festival in uh, Aberdeen City Centre the day before the Tour of Britain, it's been nominated for Scottish Cycling's Event of the Year. Um, so just a, a bit of kudos for, for, for the people that put that on. Um, one other question I had was just on page 59 about the, uh, the um, Quiet Route Cycle Network that we discussed before. Just um, if, see what the progress was. There's no target or anything in that that box. I was just wondering what, what was happening with that. Rep? Yeah, it's, it's one we're trying to progress as quickly as we can, obviously in partnership with uh, local roads authorities. Um, I think I think the intention was to try and get something done around the, the end of the year, but certainly I think the intention is within the current financial year. Sandra. Thank you. Mine is on um, page 69 around the um, Union Street City Centre master plan. And I, I just wanted to, you know, make the point that um, and, and, and Mr. Dunn mentioned earlier about ETRO2, um, that the, the street um, scape designs that are, were out for consultation in, in October, it was very difficult for, for business communities I was in. Um, business network meetings or, or for members of the public, it seemed to be um, um, unhinged from transport considerations. And, and I think, you know, that was very difficult for, for members of the public so, or, or businesses as well, or for people that live in the area. So it was just to, to flag that up and maybe to ask, um, it, you know, when that the consultation around the actual transport rather than the, the design of the street is going to be um, um, going out to consultation um, at, on Union Street. Uh, can I bring David in there? Thanks, Chair. Um, I always get worried when I hear unhinged 
um, being mentioned, but um, Councillor McDonald, so there was a consultation. So are you are you specifically speaking about the relationship between ETRO two? So in other words, the bus priority measures and the Union Street works. Yeah, well, you see, I'm not even sure what uh, you know uh, what 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 my what, what I'm trying to to get over, I guess, is that um, personally and and from what I picked up from. Um, um, the consultation that the consultations that I witnessed was that um, many people are, are were wanting to know how the transport was going to work on the street, but this and whilst there was an element of that in what was on offer for consultation, it it didn't seem to be joined up enough so that people would understand the um, the connectivity aspect of it, rather than just looking at Union Street itself and, and, and looking at how things might be designed, which is what seemed to me to be the, um, the consultation was there. It's just, and I understand that there was, you know, I know that there was a bigger picture and, and we, we've looked at Union Street quite a few times in, in consultation. So I, I get that, but, but I suppose the, my question is, well, yeah, let me ask it. What is the relationship between ETRO2, this emergency transport, and the streetscape consultation that was um, out for consultation in October? Because I'm not sure. Ha ha happy to clarify that. So the ETRO2 consultation, because it's a, a statutory roads order, was it was a separate uh, consultation and a focus consultation. So that involved um, engagement with businesses, um, notifications to all of the the people, residents living within the area, explaining how you get in and out uh, of that particular area. It was done obviously off the back of the. I'm going to call it for for want of a, a better phrase, the urban design element uh, around the Union Street piece. But fundamentally, regardless of whether Union Street was was open to public transport or closed to public transport, the ETRO2 um, bus priority measures were were required to give that redundancy and to give in particular the access to the to the train station. So uh, as it stands, because Union Street is back open to public transport, the changes to the overall network um, don't really, uh, there aren't really that many changes to the overall network. So the status quo remains. The advantage of um, what's happened with ETRL2 is obviously to give the ad additional capacity around that corridor, but also to provide the access and egress from, from the train station. So that was really the, um, the, the purpose of those two pieces of consultation. So one, ETRL2 being very much focused on the statutory process and the detail of those bypasses, the um, Union Street piece being very much more about the urban design and the sort of feel of the street and the sort of urban um, urban improvements that might be made. I hope that clarifies, but please feel free to come back to me. It does actually clarify for me, but I don't know that that has come over terribly well in the in the wider um, um, sphere, but I, I can't speak for anyone else, but that's certainly helpful. Thank you. OK, um, I've just got one quick question. Uh, it may be too soon. Um, there was supposed to be a landowners meeting on, on page 54 from um, Ellen to Aberdeen City Centre. I was just wondering if that went ahead and is there any feedback on it yet? Brad, would you know? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Chair, I can uh, find out and get back to you. OK, thank you. Um, don't seem to be any other questions. So we we'll move on to eight, uh, item eight, publications and consultations. And it's John Barrow. Barrow, sorry. Thank you, Chair. The um, first publication for noting is the draft cycling framework and delivery plan for active travel in Scotland. Um, it's coming out for consultation. It's our intention to um, bring the draft response um, to board in December. Um, among the many points um, that we will seek to highlight, some of which have been mentioned already, are the 
um, need for multi-year capital and revenue funding, um, allowing local authorities and ourselves to better build the capacity um, because to kind of go in support of the graph that was um, there earlier, um, more money in itself isn't um, the answer. There's much more needed to be um, built around the um, all the different aspects that can help uh, project delivery. Um, this framework document is a really uh, important document, I think, um, unsurprisingly. Um, it builds on the previous iterations of the Cycle and Action Plan, um, which um, and the independent review, which was made into the, the third iteration. And um, it's got a number of themed areas, um, again, some of which have been mentioned earlier, um, safe infrastructure, effective resourcing, fair access, training and education, network planning um, and monitoring. So it's a um, pivotal document which has been studied to better inform the active travel and transformation project that has been spoken about a few times today, which again is, is, is really, really important for the next few years. And I think this one will um, needs to be kind of considered um, in tandem, if you'll forgive my repeated bike puns. So um, it's for noting and we'll bring back the response. Um, spaces for people, um, which I spoke about earlier, which are the kind of temporary measures. Um, Sustrans have um, produced three reports. Um, Sustrans themselves carried out the evaluation, um, which um, perhaps maybe isn't ideal. However, that's um, um, what it did. However, the, the various reports, and there's a lot in there, um, because there was a lot learned, um, yeah, maybe good, bad, and um, kind of middle of the road uh, in between. And um, the the various reports highlight the the difficulties and obstacles and and uh, learning points that um, council officers across the country um, and roads authorities were were faced with during the, the height of the pandemic. Um, I have highlighted to Sustrans that the first linked document isn't Union Street; it's School Hill, um, but it's not still not been amended. The note. Um, and um, I maybe um, corrected something you said earlier, but in praise of Mr. Dunn and the officers he led, um, it comes upon in spades in the valuation that the uh, measures in Aberdeen were and Aberdeenshire were um, first class with, with um, all the pressures upon them. Uh, it's across now to me to continue the. Um... <laughs> the, the relay, perhaps, uh, the point four is a tax train, regional transport strategy, tax train. We had the meeting with the other day there, the regional transport partnership, taking account of Stirling, Perth and Kinross, uh, Dundee and Angus. Uh, again, they're, they're consulting on their regional transport strategy uh, and we've done a draft response. I guess the key thing really there is about how we interact on a number of key projects, such as the uh, the railway line improvements. Uh, the uh, access, improved access to Lawrence Kirk is also a key um, project of concern to both areas and we're keen to continue to put the pressure on Transport Scotland to progress that. Uh, we are also dependent upon the uh, effective movement uh, through Dundee for, 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 for many of the goods and logistics vehicles as well, uh, as well as just the, the interaction between North Angus and, and, and Aberdeenshire as well. So we've prefer, prepared a draft response for that and following if, if the board wants to prepare it, that approve it, then, then we will submit that uh, across to our, our colleagues there. Swestran is a regional transport partnership that covers the Dumfries and Galloway area of Scotland again, perhaps more remote from our area again, but we, they've, they've put a consultation out and uh, we've done a brief review of it, I guess, for those companies looking to export things through Loch Ryan in the Caird, Caird and Ryan ports to Northern Ireland, uh, perhaps from the agricultural sector or, 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 the, or the fishing sector or the manufacturing sector, perhaps that is the most relevant aspect to, to our area. And again, a draft response to that is included in Appendix B. Uh, again, if the board is minded to approve that, we will submit that. Moving on again, linking to the Rural Transport Officer discussion we've just had, linking to the review of the Health and Transport Action Plan work as well, is uh, the Community Transport Association have done a couple of pieces of work recently. They've done a, a, a GIS mapping tool. 
where you can link and find out where the community uh, busing bus activity is in the Aberdeenshire, Aberdeen City area, and you can find out further details about the services they operate. So that gives us a, a one-stop shop for community interests as to look at the resources that are available, and hopefully the CTA will manage to keep that up to date as it changes across uh, the months. And they've also done a policy report called More Than a Minibus. And again, they've made a few key points and learnings from the last couple of years, recognising the importance of funding for community transport, uh, the threat of driver shortages, the importance of volunteers, which we're picking up with the, the volunteer awards, uh, the necessity of helping that sector work towards net zero, as well as the conventional bus sector. The importance of investment in transport to health and social care, which we've talked about, fairness in concessionary travel, and again, how we can better integrate community transport uh, or the third sector transport with the wider transport network so we can get best use of both the networks working together. So we currently work with the CTA and have regular dialogue currently within that, that realm of the Health and Transport Action Plan. But I also know that Aberdeenshire Council in particular, uh, their PTU also has regular dialogue with the relevant and, and, and the various providers in, in that area as well. And I believe the Aberdeen City Council also work well with their, the providers in their particular area. So there are five recommendations uh, noting the publication of the draft cycling framework and the delivery plan for active travel, which will bring the response back to the next meeting. Uh, note the evaluation of spaces for people, lessons learned, etc. Note the publication of and draft regional transport strategy and approve the draft response. The publication of the Swestrans draft transport strategy and the draft response and the publication of the work done by CTA. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, right, any questions? No, okay, so we um, go to recommend the uh, the five points in the recommendations to the board. Thank you. Move on to uh, item nine, information bulletin, and it's Kelly Wilkshire, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this report is really just to give an overview of um, things that are happening that don't necessarily require a decision from the board. So the first item is press and communications and all of the press inquiries, media releases and coverage that are relevant to Nestrans are available in Appendix 1. The next one is we've done a get about overview. Councillor Reid at the last meeting was asking questions about get about, so we thought this was a good opportunity to give an overview about what the get about partnership is who's involved and what it's trying to achieve. So the Get About Partnership is a group of organisations that work together to promote active and sustainable transport and also road safety. Um, the partnership is very much voluntary and there is a working group that meets regularly throughout the year and has done throughout the pandemic as well virtually. And we've done this for over 10 years. Um, the group share information and best practice as well as collaborating and sharing resources. So that includes staff time, budget and marketing items for undertaking promotional campaigns and events. And one of the events, as uh, Colin Allen mentioned earlier, was um, the Get About Village the day before the Tour of Britain. That was um, Get About Partners um, working together to make that happen. Um, the Get About Partners, I've listed them all there, but it's basically the universities and college, the two local authorities, NHS Grampian, the James Hutton Institute and the Energy Savings Trust. And as I say, we all meet regularly. Um, there is not a lead partner. What we have tried to do over the last 10 years is to have a rotating chair. So each partner has a go, if you like it, chairing. And uh, Nesh Trans is chairing uh, the working group this year and John is uh, doing that role. Um, but that does change on an annual basis. It's not always Nesh Trans. Um, in terms of staff time and marketing and budget, um, we have a budget. We also have a dedicated member of staff and our communications and marketing um, member of staff who works three days a week. So Nesh Trans probably does have quite a big input in to get about because we have that a dedicated staff member and we do also have some um, budget 
towards things but other partners certainly contribute in terms of their staff time and budget as well and certainly things in the past that we've done perhaps um nest trans has funded adverts on one radio station but one of the local authorities has uh, funded another radio station or aberdeenshire council has funded television adverts and we funded an, a different aspect of marketing just so we can have a much bigger um cross section if you like different types of marketing that we wouldn't be able to afford as an individual partner but when we all come together we can actually do quite a large and significant campaign the work that the get about partnership does is very relevant to our regional transport strategy including mode shift air quality carbon reduction and zero fatalities on the road network um we do campaigns to highlight the health benefits of travel choices, promoting active travel, um, air quality improvements, um, and also around road safety. Our current campaign is Be Bright at Night, which is very much focused on people being visible and trying to reduce um, particularly pedestrian um, casualties, which do peak at this time of the year. We do very much try and link things with data so for example our be bright at night we're doing it at this time of year focusing on places like the city center where our trend data over several years of um road safety casualties is that's when the peak is if you like in terms of um pedestrian casualties so that's why we're focusing on those things we also work with partners outside of the get about partnership who are also happy to work within that brand if you like for example police scotland and the scottish fire and rescue service and um, the city wardens as well have been really helpful with us over the last couple of years particularly on our road safety campaigns um, last year police scotland um, distributed 110 sets of bike lights over a couple of month period to cyclists that their officers saw that didn't have bike lights so that was certainly something we helped fund the bike lights, we gave them to the police and they distributed them on our behalf and they were branded get about. So we've done various sort of campaigns and joint work. Um, over the summer, we did quite a lot of work around sharing space, which obviously has been quite um, relevant. And we've discussed it uh, here as well about pedestrians and cyclists and horse riders sharing the same um, space. And we also were very much focused on the changes to the highway code that came out earlier this year um, and just being respectful of other people and knowing what that hierarchy and what the changes were. Um, what Get About really is trying to do is act as an information um, and signposting. So we've got a website, getabout.org.uk, and within that we have all the different modes that people can click on how, you know, in terms of walking or cycling, going by car, going by bus, and there are pages with lots of information and resources um, and signposting there, right down to walking trails and um, cycle maps and so on. We're working collaboratively to address barriers and to advocate on behalf of all the different modes. We try as much as possible to evaluate our advertising campaigns. They tend to be evaluated by the tools that we use. So if we're advertising on social media, that's very easy to get evaluation back. We can see who has seen it, how many times, all those sort of things. It's slightly more difficult to evaluate you know, how many people have listened to a uh, radio ad. We have um, an idea and obviously the companies tell us this is what your, your readership is or your listenership. So we can have a little bit, but ultimately for us, the most relevant evaluation is whether there's actually been a behavioural change and how people travel, such as a mode split or a reduction in casualty. And we do do annual monitoring reports on all of these things each year. We did do a much fuller evaluation in 2018, um, which involved focus groups and surveys. And I've put a link to that in there as well. Um, the next uh, thing I'm going, there are slightly linked but slightly different, is the Community Sustainable Travel Grant. This is a Nestrans um, grant that we do. We have a Sustainable Travel Grant which offers up to 50% and a maximum of £10,000 to support businesses and organisations to deliver sustainable travel facilities or infrastructure. 
but we also have a community sustainable travel grant which is more for smaller organizations and charities and um, community groups and um, which can potentially be up to 100 percent of funding and could potentially be advanced funding if that would hinder them if that wasn't um, able to be done. We've done a number of schemes over the last year through the Community Sustainable Travel Grant and they're in Appendix 2 of the report. Um, so there's a few community groups that have already applied and implemented their projects as well. And I will pass on to John for the next couple. But happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. The Better than corridor um, connections, um, we thought this uh, worthy of um, sending to board as well for information. Um, we've spoken a few times today about network planning and the importance of joining up the links to make it um, more coherent and um, usable for those with active travel. Um, here's one which has moved slightly quicker than some of the other corridors that have been mentioned. Um, the, the outcomes were reported to the recent um, City Growth and Resources Committee um, who noted they actually um, surpassed the recommendations and, and added in some more detailed recommendations within um, the business case. Um, and there's a lot in there. It's a, it's an unusual corridor even in the city in terms of it goes from um, only residential to obviously abutting onto the Forster Hill campus. So um, there's a kind of lot of work in there. Um, I'll commend the consultants and City Council Road Projects team who are overseeing it. Um, and it's now progressing to the next steps to look at um, some of the detail of um, how some of these things may be implemented um, with more um, direction and um, also the A947, um, the multimodal um, corridor study, the funded by Nestrans um, was also reported to the same committee and there's a um, substantial number of options recommended for progressing to the, the next stage of the um, STAG. Uh, Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance Process um, under the headings of active travel, placemaking and public transport interventions. So um, there are a whole list of these options and there are lots of them. Um, there are a number of small scale which they describe as quick wins um, that the consultants determined could be implemented quickly uh, with minimum resource and they don't require major infrastructure. Um, and it was proposed that they be funded using the um, Nestrans budget um, for minor improvements. Um, the list um, is, is obviously there for you to, to peruse, and that's just um, along with the, the get about brief, it's there for information. And we're, as Kelly says, we're happy to answer any more um, detail. So, any questions? No, so we have, uh, it's just to recommend the bill that they note the contents of this report. And we will move on to item 10, conferences and presentations, and that'll be wrap. Thanks, Chair. The conferences and presentations, again, is, is just for noting, um, but perhaps I could draw attention to the fact that uh, Kirsty is doing a presentation to the Scottish Transport Research Conference uh, in Glasgow next week, I think. Um, on the regional transport strategy and Aberdeen rapid transit. So quite, quite pleased that uh, we'll have a high profile at that and it fits in, I think, with uh, what we're doing elsewhere. So thank you. OK, I don't think there's any questions on that. So we'll move on to item 11, pending business and reports for further meetings, and that's wrap. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we always bring forward a report giving an indication of which items we've picked up from previous pending business reports, uh, which are there in the first uh, category of bullet points, and to give a list of things that we intend bringing forward. And I've certainly got a list from today's meeting, I think maybe of a couple more in addition to the bullet points we have there. The next meeting, though, 8th of December, we have uh, spoken to Robert Andrew, who is the chair of the Northeast Bus Alliance, and he is prepared to come and do a, a short presentation to the board. I think Kirsty mentioned that under the, the bus action plan item. Um, and we'll also be bringing the bus uh, action plan update to that meeting. So a bit of a focus maybe in the early December meeting on bus issues, which I think would be uh, hopefully useful to the members. 
I'm happy to take any other comments, suggestions of reports that members would like to see coming forward, uh, and, and we'll do that in the in the, in the forthcoming uh, meetings. Thank you, Isabel. It's this, and also relevant to the um, information bulletin as well, and the campaign for North East Rail for a new railway line to the north. And I wondered um, what uh, communication we've had with the campaign, and if um, Nestra. I know Nestra has taken a particular view in the past that it's not involved um, with um, a North East Rail project, but I wondered what our attitude, and if we were to review our attitude, is to this project. If I may, Chair, we have been in touch with CNER. Um, they they've, have communicated with us. Um, as you'll know, we, we did do a full feasibility study, perhaps of a slightly different geography and a slightly different route, but we Nestrans funded uh, about a quarter of a million pounds uh, a feasibility study about six or seven years ago. Um, but CNER, we understand, have been allocated funding from Sc Scottish Government's Just Transition Fund. Um, and we would like to work with them in terms of trying to determine what it is they want to do different from the previous study, whether it's just an update, whether it's uh, a complete restart, so we will be looking to communicate with them over the coming months. Uh, I have a meeting set up, I think for next week actually, with uh, council officers, particularly at Aberdeenshire, both in planning and in transportation. And following that, I will speak to CNER and just see how best to work with them uh, in, in terms of making sure that uh, a study gets the best value for that money. Um, you know, and that we actually make progress on it and aren't just in a position that we found ourselves the last time. Um, what I should maybe say is that a lot of what's been in the press about, about the campaign, we probably shared some of the frustrations that the way that we were required to cost the, the scheme is quite restrictive. Um, and from our perspective, it was all about making a business case. It was about costs and benefits, working with the rail industry to make sure that that was robust and professional. And I think there's maybe a different aspect in terms of the emotion and the politics with a small P, possibly a capital P as well. Um, but you know, there's maybe a case to be made, which is slightly different from the, the outline business case which I think is where we are coming from. But my summary of all that would be, I think there's two elements to it. It's about the making the case and it's about the business side, the costs and benefits. And we'll try and make sure that we, we do the best as we can. Thanks very much. I think it will be interesting to have updates on what's happening. Um, you know, I've been around since the days when Howard Fisher decided to buy the railway line for a pound to um, keep that route open and and I was also responsible for quite a lot of the construction of the Fermat and Buffer Way. So um it, it, you know I've had a lot to do with it in the past. And it would be and we used to play on the railway line when we were kids as well, which wasn't always the safest thing. But there weren't many trains. But it would be good. I would like to see it, you know, come back into consideration at some point. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much through you, Chair. I mean, certainly something that I think we would all be really keen to see. Um, our, our regional transport strategy does leave up, open the options to look at the feasibility as and when things change. And by that, I mean like costs um, uh, and the cost of travelling as well. You know, if, if petrol was more expensive, if car parking was more expensive, how does that impact on business cases, etc.? And yeah, people say might say, well, I would like car parking to be less expensive, but that does have an impact on on feasibility. Um, so yeah, we, we we certainly bring forward something, and we'll try and report back to the board as as progress is made. Dory, I think you also have to bring time 
into the consideration for further up the line because to Ellen, perfectly feasible to Frisborough and Peterhead. I'm not so sure so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, totally agree. And, and that perhaps that's one of the things that came out the last time that, you know, we really need to think about phases and what's feasible in a short term, what's feasible in, in the medium term and then long term. Um, but yeah, journey times and the timescales in which we can deliver things uh, do, do give us some constraints, if I can put it that way. Okay, I think that's uh, all the questions there. So we just need to note uh, the report on pending business. Uh, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Uh, thank you all for coming today and uh, I'll see you next month. Thank you.